Yes. Okay, everyone. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I do apologize for that short uh, intrusion. I, I had to figure out how to record this. It seems like I was using a different account. Um, anyway, it is absolutely my pleasure um, to host today's forum. It happens to be a forum today because we have two um, STEAM guests who will be participating in a discussion about a very interesting publication, an important publication, uh, which I'll briefly introduce. Um, but uh, to begin with, let me just say, first and foremost, that today's forum, um, or book forum, uh, has been sponsored by Program for the Civil Religion and Middle East Program Studies Program at UC San Diego. Uh, we are having this uh, on Zoom for obvious reasons. It makes things much easier. But at the same time, it, it does not allow us to have a kind of a physical interaction, which would, would be ideally uh, we would have. But nevertheless, uh, we are blessed to have this interesting encounter here, um, given the fact that um, thanks to this kind of a cooperation, we've been managed, since especially COVID, to uh, host a number of events through Zoom, inviting a number of leading scholars to discuss culture, politics, and religion in the broader context of global modernity or modernities. Uh, speaking of uh, leading scholars, uh, it is my honor to introduce you to today's guest speaker who will speak in a forum regarding his latest memoir published by Edinburgh University Press, uh, The Loneliest Revolution, a Memoir of Solidarity and Struggle in Iran. Professor Ali Mir Sapasi, who many may know, um, is Albert Gallatin Research Excellent, Excellence Professor of Middle East Middle Eastern Studies and Islamic Studies at Gallatin and in the Department of Middle East, Eastern and Islamic Studies in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at NYU. He's also the Director of Iran Studies Initiative at NYU. In addition, he's the Affiliate Faculty at NYU Sociology Department uh, in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Professor Mir Sapasi is the author, co-author, and the editor of numerous books. It's just virtually impossible for me to list them here. But just to give you a sense, uh, just to mention a few, Iran's Troubled Modernity, Debating Ahmad Fadid's Legacy, published by Cambridge University Press in 2018, Transnationalism in Iranian Political Thought, The Life and Thought of Ahmad Fadid, also published by Cambridge University Press in 2017, Intellectual Discourses and Politics of Modernization, Negotiating, Negotiating Modernity in Iran. This is a classic, also published by Cambridge University Press. And uh, of course, my favorite, which I'm using for my research a lot, um, Iran's Quiet Revolution, The Downfall of the Pahlavi State, which was published in 2019, also by Cambridge University Press. There are others, uh, but it's just because our time is limited, I'm, I'm just gonna refer everyone to Professor Mustafasi's website. Um, now, we, the discussion about uh, his latest publication will be led by two uh, guests who I'm honored to very briefly here introduce. Uh, Professor Hamid Dabashi doesn't really need an introduction, but I'm going to give one for those who may not know him. Um, known as a leading public intellectual and a leading cultural theorist by Washington Post, Professor Dabashi is uh, Hakob. Uh, Kavorkian Professor of Iran Studies and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. His books include Authority in Islam. This is his, one of his earlier books in 1989. And I have to say, this is also a long list of publications. So I'm just going to limit to three or four here. Uh, but um, his other major, major book, you know, is Theology of Discontent, published by Columbia University in 1993. Truth and Narrative, 1999. Close up, Iranian um Cinema, Past, Present, Future, 2001, I believe, but Verso. Iran, A People Interrupted, a very interesting book that was published in 2007. Um, and then again, the list goes on, Iran Without Borders, towards a critique of the post-colonial nation, um, published by Verso. Uh, and his latest publication here, I briefly mentioned, uh, apparently it was already published. I thought it was going to be published this summer, but apparently it has been published. An Iranian Childhood, Rethinking History and Memory, uh, published by Cambridge University Press, I believe. Um, it is also my honor to introduce uh, uh, Kiana Karimi, who is a PhD candidate in performance studies and a doctoral fellow at Urban Democracy Lab at New York University. 
Her dissertation research focuses on micropolitics of everyday life and the performance of gender in Iran, which promises to be a fascinating research subject. Um, now that we have introduced everyone, um, I haven't got a chance to introduce myself, uh, Bob Akrahimi, for those who do not know me. Uh, I teach in the program for the Soviet of religion at UC San Diego. I'm also based in the Department of Literature. And um, I cannot tell you how excited I am about today's forum. Uh, what we uh, have agreed to do is to have our discussions to go first for 15 to 20 minutes. And then Professor Mr. Pasi will respond. And then afterwards, we'll have the Q&A. And I will lead the Q&A with um, one or two questions. Uh, I'm hoping everyone would um, uh, keep themselves mute while others are speaking. And um, we are, of course, abiding by the ideal of respect and mutual understanding and good discussion. And for now, I'm going to open up our forum to our two discussants, um, Professor Dabashi um, um, and um, uh, Kiana Academy. Would you like to start uh, the forum? However you like to go, I, whoever wants to go first. I'll be happy to go second, Kiano. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd be wonderful if you go first. Yeah, <laughs> then I get some confidence. From <laughs> uh, with pleasure. I'm delighted to be here, Bobak John. Thank you for uh, including me in this conversation for a book that uh, I deeply love and admire. I have known this book from its very inception. Uh, and I'd like to begin by, uh, I mean, it's very difficult for me to praise Ali in front of Ali. I always praise him behind his back, writing the letters for him, endorsing his books and such. But this book, uh, I mean, I share Bobak's uh, assessment of Ali's extraordinary work by this position. I'm very suspicious of uh, those who write memoirs, but except those who have reached the age of me and Ali and have done their dues, they have done, like Ali has, and as Bobak just described, substantial work in political history, social history, intellectual history, and so forth. And uh, as I said in my recommendation of the book, for publication. This is a scholar whose every sentence in this book is rooted in a lifetime of uh, scholarship. Uh, the book itself has this bizarre, provocative title, Loneliest Revolution. Uh, revolutions are not lonely by definition. They're public events. We just go out in the street and scream, long live this, down with that. It's a social persona that comes out, and it is one of the most extraordinary aspects of this particular prose that Ali has written, that, uh, in fact, brings out the paradox, not just about the Iran revolution of 77, 79, but in all social acts of that magnitude, that, in fact, there is a loneliness or a solitude at the heart of it, which Ali brings out. Uh, as those of you who have had the chance to read the book, the book begins with a bombshell, uh, an, attem uh, an attempted assassination of uh, Ali himself when he was a political activist, a revolutionary activist in Tehran, you know, sharing his political thoughts with his audience, with his classmates, with his friends. And then there is this attempt against his life, which fortunately for us, his friends, fortunately for the posterity of Iranian uh, scholarship, uh, etc. Uh, he survived the, the assassination attempt. Uh, now, there it is a lot to be said uh, about this book, and I'm sure Kiana will uh, be uh, uh, detailed in her assessment. I just want to talk about the prose of the of the book, because it's a unique prose. It's a prose that is autobiographical, but by a scholar. Uh, usually scholars kind of, Michel Foucault said, all scholarship is hidden autobiography. 
but it's hidden, this is behind. And uh, something is happening to us. I'm almost the same age as Ali. Uh, Ali, am I younger than you or are you younger than me? What? Yeah. I can't hear you. You're mute, Ali. You're mute. You're mute. You're mute. Hamidjan, you are one year younger than me, but of course wiser. <laughs> yeah. At any rate, it's something I think is generational that uh, or climate or uh, uh, distance from Iran or anything that, that somebody else has to decide. Uh, that uh, our generation, generation of Ali and me, that are really, we are not uh, what the French call soixante with TM, the 68ers. We're really 70 people. <clears throat> and Michael Hart just is published, is about to come out. I have read it to endorse it. Subversive 70s. The book is called Subversive 70s. Something happened in the 70s. And then as soon as I endorsed it, I said, of course, we operate on a different calendar, not on 70s. We are uh, right now, our generation of Ali and me has become a curse by the Pahlavi monarchists. They call us Panjo Haftia, Panjo Haftia. Panjo Haftia has become a curse that, you know, we were, uh, uh, we were wrong in believing even, not even doing, believing what we uh, believed. But bracketing that pathology, which has a different understanding, I think something has happened, whether we go with the Iranian calendar or with uh, European calendar, something has happened in our generation that requires this prose, that this prose is coming out. Uh, the other part of this prose is that despite the fact that it is written in English, the interlocutor is Iranian, somebody who's deeply aware of Iranian history. And uh, it is not in a prose that uh, is part of the sort of memoir industry that comes into English to tell the English speaking, uh, speaking readers, lo and behold, I was harassed, I was tortured, I was you know, uh, being discriminated against and uh, this and that. It is not that prose. The prose is not plaintive, it's not coming to a white person to tell the white person, lo and behold, what horrible experiences I had. Quite to the contrary. Uh, I am even opposed to those who call this prose uh, <clears throat> autoethnography. Autoethnography is not ethnographic. Ali is not banking on his ethnos, but actually on his bios, on his political life. And it is this political consciousness of Ali as, a, as an individual, as an Iranian, as a political revolutionary, that uh, ha having done all the scholarship, having written all the uh, uh, historical assessment of what has happened in Iran of 20th century, suddenly brings this uh, authorial voice uh, of this I, this authorial voice, which we have lacked, uh, and uh, gives uh, what Agamben calls the, the uh, uh, bios, as opposed to uh, Zoe. Zoe is our animality, it's just everybody is a human being. But bios, which is political consciousness, historical consciousness, uh, a prose that is impossible to, uh, to ignore. Now, what actually Ali says about the revolution and how, what happened in the aftermath of the 77, 79, and then his move. First of all, uh, we might be beguiled by the early parts of Durud and Golpayagan and, and so forth, which are sweet and wonderful, but yet is still infused with political consciousness. The latter part of the, of the book then becomes uh, an element of uh, uh, not uh, migration or exile. Uh, again, in my reading of it, quite to the contrary, but being in the world, the word the, the, the word world has had a very seminal significant significance both in Ali's work and in my own work. And 
as a result, the, the prose of this book can be read by anybody who's interested in Cuban revolution or in uh, the Vietnam uh, war or in uh, American civil rights movement. It has a character that in a larger global and comparative context, we have lacked by those of us who have been marginalized and self-alienated to have something to say about uh, a global context from a specifically Iranian uh, point of view. Uh, 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 now, third world socialism, Marxism, um, all of those ideological aspects, in my opinion, pale in comparison to something far more important, which is the historical consciousness of, uh, uh, of a person that has a straggle, straddled from the smallest towns and villages of Iran coming to Tehran as, as the cosmopolitan center of our consciousness, but ultimately coming out to the world. So what the prose does, and I think does it remarkably and impossible to uh, misread it, is not, oh, I was here an Iranian revolutionary activist, but then I go, was got, almost got killed and then I came here, I ain't I lucky. Uh, that is not uh, how the prose reads. The prose reads the bringing into a global consciousness of a writer, of a thinker, uh, of a critical apparatus of thinking. So the implication of the, the book of, this book of Ali in particular is far beyond sort of adding a personal twist to something that he has done for a very long time. It is actually enriching and empowering the uh, authorial voice of the next generation. And I'm happy Kiana is here and she will talk more to that. The next generation of critical writing that is no longer forced to hide behind uh, this position of just informing this, the English speaking world of what has happened in my hometown, but actually enriching, enabling and empowering a whole different mode of writing in a cosmopolitan context, such as New York, that all of us come from somewhere else or in, in US in general, that has historically lacked a specifically Iranian voice. And Ali has had the courage and the conviction and imagination and erudition and capacity to add that voice. So I'm going to stop here, Baba John is 24, but again, in the course of conversation, if there is more for me to say, I will jump in. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, right on time. Thank you, excellent. Um, Kiana John, please go ahead. You're, you're on mute. I will be mindful of time, but Bob, actually, if you feel at any moment that you feel like going That's over, fine. Please. That's fine. It's absolutely okay. It's okay. Yes. Okay. So first of all, it's truly my honor to be part of this panel alongside Professor Dabashi and Professor Mirza Parsi, uh, both of whom I've learned immensely from. And if you're familiar with their work, you're going to see the traces of their intellectual work in my um, speech as well. And thank you, Bob, actually, for the invitation. Um, I know Professor Mirza Pasi since eight years ago, uh, added as it is the uh, sort of the ritual of many young um, scholars who end up in New York City. I paid a visit to his office uh, about eight years ago, not knowing what was my direction. And like many other men and women, that first visit was followed by the second visit and third visit and fourth visit. And I was very fortunate that it sparked a truly a wonderful and incredible friendship that I admire. Um, so I cannot really have an objective analysis of this book because it's very close to my heart. Since Ali John is very close to my heart, uh, I was complaining to him that I wouldn't be able to possibly say something critical in the spirit of academic analysis here. Uh, and he said, it's fine, just say what you would like to say. Um, but putting all that aside, two years ago, when I first read the manuscript of The Loneliest Revolution, uh, first of all, I loved it and I found it incredibly pluralistic in so many ways that I'm going to talk about. But at the time, if you would tell me 
Uh, can you say a few words to a non-Iranian audience about the book? I would definitely try to situate it in the market of the memoir, the often female memoir uh, that is sort of populates uh, the narrative, the literary narrative of what we see of the diasporic and exile writers uh, from the Middle East. Uh, if you follow even from far the scene of memoir production, you probably know uh, that there are tropes that really dominates uh, the type of narrative and the type of stories that comes out. And at some point, maybe like four or five years ago, I felt really this figure of woman, the Iranian woman or Muslim woman, that is central to these type of narratives have completely lost meaning. It has been filled and unfilled with so many different signifiers and so many different significations and meaning that somehow it seems more productive to put this figure of women aside and try to make sense of uh, the politics of the Middle East, the everyday politics of the Middle East from some other lens. And, and exactly because of this, when I saw finally, there is a memoir that captures the perspective of a male figure who is closely involved in the 1979 revolution, but also before and after that. Uh, if someone asks me today to suggest a memoir or any sort of, sort of work of literature from the Middle East uh, to understand gender politics, I would suggest the Lonely Earth Revolution because uh, not only because it, it is written by a man, but because the way uh, that is written, that it sort of brings together different genealogies of thoughts, different ways of thinking, of world making, in the way that I feel has been truly absent from the literature of the Middle East. There are of course exceptions, but let's not go, go there. Uh, before really going deeper into my analysis, I really wanna uh, pinpoint something that I found special in this memoir. And that was the fact that, well, up until, interesting, Hamidjan, up until 70s, usually the work of creative literature, when it was about the self, it would use the self to understand something bigger, to understand the world. It was always, a leap from the individual, from the particular to the universal. And then after the trauma theory and the ideas of the traumatized self, the wounded body that sort of dominated the intellectual discourses, but also literary discourses during the 90s and onward, uh, well, maybe also neoliberalism and capitalism and all that, the self-care business of capitalism can be blamed for that. But right now, memoir to me, if I hear the word memoir, I would assume that we're uh, going to expect a writer who would start from this childhood problem, childhood trauma, and pretty much stays in that childhood trauma throughout the book. That leap to the universal is truly absent. And actually recently a critic at the New Yorker was talking about what he phrased as the trauma plot, which exactly talks about the fact that what has happened to the function of literature as something that that's supposed to let us help understand not the self, but the other. Uh, so not, I'm trying to say not only in the context of the memoirs that are coming from the marginalized communities and diasporic communities, but also in the bigger sense of what has become of literature and especially the genre of memoir writing, I do believe that the loneliest revolution is truly a corrective to this consumption with the self that asking me only adds and only reproduces the type of politics that we are dealing with, especially in US right now, the divergence and the lack of common ground uh, and the um, inability of many of us to even understand what the other is saying. So yeah, that is really just a, try to say in a nutshell that uh, I think this book is a wonderful uh, and incredibly timely, um, corrective to the genre of memoir and what has become of memoir writing in this late age of capitalism, neoliberalism, however you want to phrase that, like the, find the roots of the problem. That's one thing. But then um, being in the May of 2023, it's impossible to talk about this book without mentioning just how relevant it is to many of the questions that we in the Iranian diaspora have been grappling with since last September, when the uh, Kurdish Iranian woman, 
Jina Masamini was brutally killed in the custody of the Iranian police. And the uh, uprising, the na nationwide uprising that uh, ensued afterwards. Um, <clears throat> these are the moments that I I'm guessing some of you would agree that we do have a clear politics when we imagine ourselves in the geography, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in the geography of Iran. We also do have a very clear politics when we imagine ourselves in the geography of the empire, in our location um, in the US, in the West. But then comes this space of diasporic examination. And in this space, in this liminal space, things get tricky. There is tension, and I think this tension is productive. So I'm going to talk about it. And uh, well, I guess I'm very selfishly because I'm a very young researcher. I looked at this book uh, as a way of helping me understand my own questions and uh, finding my own answers. And in the spirit of the fact that this event is happening in a university, I'm, I'm using this theme because only hoping it would be useful to other students as well. Um, so yeah, diasporic politics for an Iranian often, mean, often means finding oneself in this complex position where on the one hand, we all <clears throat> are critical of the interventionist politics of the empire. We're concerned about the rise of Islamophobia. We are acutely aware of the dangers of Islamophobia and the systematic discrimination against Muslim minorities, not only in the US, but everywhere. So when our leftist allies, when our Western feminist allies talk about Islamophobia, we do agree with the, uh, with the, uh, the intention, the, the, the question that they're uh, talking about and the type of politics that they're setting forth. At the same time, being from Iran, it also means that, well, most of us, I'm a women's rights activist, but I'm sure many of you in all different ways have been trying to challenge the heteronormative and patriarchal norms that dominate the Iranian society. And then, well, since 1979, that domination has a very clear and uh, crisp uh, um, systematic face within the state as a state that well, rightfully or not, uh, uses, appropriates Islam as a way to justify the discrimination against women. So being in diaspora often means, at least for me, often means it's sort of being so consumed with this idea of context, because if context in Iran, I would say one thing, and if the context is used, I would say something else. Uh, and then this, we, most of us can embody both lines of thoughts and we are very quick in sort of this code switching. And I think I, I would be comfortable saying that we've all developed a sort of double consciousness in the way that Du Bois phrases and many feminists have talked about. But then comes uh, an uprising uh, called Woman Life Freedom in Iran. And this uprising, although being truly unprecedented in so many ways, does not receive the type of solidarity that at least many of us ex uh, expected in the US. And we, we can sniff the reason. Uh, the reason is that, uh, at least in my opinion, um, the concern about Islamophobia has created this space that any form of solidarity with women who are opposing compulsory hijab or women who are opposing discriminatory laws against women can create this contradiction, at least on surface, that, okay, what are we doing with this uh, question of religion or question of cultural values? Uh, I feel this is something that as um, scholars that are focused on Middle Eastern politics and Middle Eastern studies, we have to think about. Because while, as I said, I agree with the solidarity of uh, Western leftists and feminists uh, with marginalized communities, I did expect them, and I do expect them to also show solidarity 
when there is death after death, after imprisonment, after torture of women inside Iran. And I did not see that. Many of us did not see that. And this sort of became a topic about, uh, so what is happening to these genealogies of feminism, the transnational feminism that we have talked about? Uh, if there's something similar to women life freedom had happened in say Latin America or in Southeast Asia, I think the response from the uh, Western feminists would be very different. But coming from the Middle East, it always creates this mystified, obscure scene that is so different, so difficult to navigate. Uh, I said all of this to say, okay, there's this at least seemingly paradox, seemingly contradiction, when we don't know if there is really a contradiction or not, and asking me there is not. But here's the point that I like to enter into the book, uh, because I do think that this memoir, exactly because of the way it relates to other people, does offer a remedy and does offer a way of thinking about moments when uh, seemingly paradoxical and contradictory lines of thoughts are either colluding or converging or confronting each other in different ways. And here I need to make a small parenthesis. Well, the book is in the context of Iran in a certain time frame, but uh, I feel the questions that these way of thinking that Ali John sets forth offers really is relevant far beyond Iran or far far beyond the uh, 70s because I feel the, uh, the type of challenges that it tries to grapple with is very similar to the challenges that we try to grapple with in US today, whether it's about the, uh, the, the debate around the abortion or about the gun laws, uh, there is this lack, on lack of common ground that I, I think hasn't been allowed any sort of productive and meaningful conversation of both sides. Uh, and I do feel part of it is because of the way we actually enter these conversation and we start thinking about these questions. And to me, uh, the type of writing that Ali John offers in this book is a response in the sense that, well, the best word I have for it to explain is actually empathy, which is not the best word uh, intellectually. I, I couldn't find a, a just like a deserving to just uh, definition for it. But uh, the book, the writer of the book really enters every single debate, every single scene with what uh, the philosopher Richard Rorty uh, phrases as the ironic intellectual. It's an intellectual that is always carrying a degree of ambivalence, a degree of ambiguity, and is making an attempt, failed or not, to put herself or himself in the position of the other before making any judgment. Uh, and Ali John does it over and over and over in different conversations. Oh, Ajahn, am I out of time? Uh, just Please. probably another minute, that would be. Yeah, okay. So yeah, yeah, I, I'm going to finish immediately. Uh, I feel this figure is something that can help us, especially in the way that this book narrates and explores. It can help us um, sort of unpack these two lines of political and theoretical thought that has created uh, spaces of tension to the extent that solidarity with a movement as big and as important as woman life freedom is not as possible as it should be. And while well, going back historically, uh, I think there's sort of a paradigm, uh, like an important, uh, not a paradigm shift, but there's something here in the sense that, well, often throughout history, when theories become so fixated and so essentialist and so reductive, it's often the performance or the art or the literature that can come to the rescue of the thinker because it is, again, uh, the way that situates the mind and the body within the everyday life and within the specifics of what people care about and how people make sense of. In that sense, I do want to pitch The Loneliest Revolution as a book to any young scholar who finds herself or himself uh, sort of confused, and this is a productive confusion asking me, in these different lines of thinking and genealogies that do make sense in their own context, 
But then in the stage of the global transnational politics, they become something that can create paradoxical situation or something that can create hindrances, obstacles to form the type of uh, solidarity that we're hoping to see from each other around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Arijan, now mm, the, yes. the, pl the platform is for you now. Thank you so much, uh, Babak John, and let me um, um, briefly um, um, uh, express my gratitude to you, to um, to just um, in a moment um, uh, volunteer to organize this uh, this event and then do do lots of hard work to make it make it happen. Uh, I, I believe this was even before the book was published. I I appreciate this and I, and, and, and um, I have to say that this is both intellectually and particularly emotionally um, uh, a wonderful moment for me to have this so formal events about a book that um, I'm about to briefly discuss um, um, my relationship with it or its history um, that um, uh, that that you did this uh, and I have two very dear colleagues and friends. Hamid and Kiana, who I, of course, admire, and and they are friends, and they are extremely smart. I I am honored, uh, Hamid John and and Kiana John, uh, to just hear every word that you have to say. And yes, I did say, don't worry if you don't come up with critical um, um, commentaries because um, uh, this is how I, how I see these events. I actually don't mind people criticizing my work. Babak John, you have uh, reviewed one of my earlier work and um, um, you were of course very generous and but nevertheless it was critical and I enjoy enjoy it. Um, but this is a different kind of, of work um, and this is a different kind of event and I felt that I have I can say this morally, ethically. I can say that. Well, um, um, I was a little hesitant, but approach Babak and say, uh, you know, how about if if these two friends <laughs> are the discussions? I would never ever do this if this was a, a an academic book. I would, of course, um, have anyone, including people who I don't know, to speak. Uh, thank you so much, Babak. John. This was both generous and kind, but also personally, I am um, I'm grateful to you that this is the event. There was an earlier event by my uh, former colleagues, but it was more of a private <laughs> event. Um, but this is something that I would love to share with everyone. Um, um, hopefully the recording with book and, and, and thank you, you all of those 50 or uh, so uh, folks who have showed up, this is like, I sort of feel that this is a ritual and everybody who is here, I would like to be able to hug and, and thank, but um, it's very hard to hug anyone on Zoom, but um, but thank you everyone. Um, secondly, I, I did something with the hope of, with the hope that both Hamid and Kiana would say what, not in terms of content, in terms of ideas that they will share, so that I can, um, I can say something about the book, but also respond to some of the ideas and questions that they um, 
they would raise. I did this, of course, before today. So I prepared um, a set of notes and I am delighted to say that what I was hoping that will happen um, exactly happened. So uh, if you don't mind, I am not gonna respond um, individually to you, sure. but, um, but um, uh, what I I think what I have prepared will work, and and um, I'm not going to necessarily read, but um, not to be um, uh, not to make life uh, difficult for you, <laughs> uh, Babak John. I I I have my notes, and there are some quotes that I would read. Otherwise, I may go for. A, that's fine. We have we have time. We have uh, one hour and fifteen minutes. So, no, but I'm not, not going to go too long. Oh, okay. We will see. Sure, sure. Um, um, uh, um, soon after this book was published, I the book was published in in at uh, the end of March. I think this was first week of April that somebody who is a very close to me, um, partly relative, partly a close friend, who is always very frank and straightforward to me, called me and said, I think I have the, the code. After saying, you know, something nice, <laughs> um, um, said, um, he, he, he wondered and said, why have you written all of these personal stories for the whole world to know? Uh, this is a person who is close to me, but heard of the book from a mutual friend, right? And I did not expect <laughs> this particular friend to make this comment. And, and, and of course I was annoyed, I uh, actually did not want to discuss this and said, before you call me, go and read the book. Uh, that conversation ended, but the truth is that um, I struggle with why do I want to write a memoir? And after I decided that I do want to write a memoir or convince myself, that I, I need to do this. Um, how do you write a memoir? And how do you approach it? And how do you imagine it? These are a set of questions that, that I think Hamid raised on this. I have to say something in parentheses. Um, uh, Hamid said that he has read or has been involved with with this book um, uh, by reading the manuscript or something to that effect. Uh, but Hamid was one of those individuals, two or three of my friends, who have been encouraging me to do uh, to do this, to write my memoir. Um, I am actually personally, I, I did not like uh, and, and I never thought that there would be a day that I would uh, write my memoir. I, I wrote a short piece. Um, I, I sent that draft. And at the time, I just wanted to just write that short piece to Hamid. And Hamid's comments really was uh, um, uh, incredibly generous and encouraging. And then, of course, very early draft of the manuscript I sent to Hamid. Um, I have to say that I, I haven't had this experience with anyone else. I think Hamid shared with me about 10 pages of comments, uh, critical, but all encouraging. Um, and in fact, if it is true, and there is something about the prose of this book, uh, that is different and a little original. I owe it to you because you pointed to some of the um, some of the um, uh, 
sections of the book and uh, made very thoughtful comments about the prose. And that also encouraged me. Of course, I was always a little um, uncomfortable with the fact that when we write academic books, we have to write it in a way that outside reviewers <laughs> would read them and, um, and would write um, positive reviews. But not to get credit for the actual work, um, I was, in fact, in, in, in one of the um, 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 earlier um, comments that I got from uh, Hamid, Hamid said, why do you have so many footnotes? So I cut some footnotes, but even when I send the book to the publisher and then publisher send it to the reviewers, I still had about you know, 100, 120 footnotes, and it wasn't this, um, you probably don't like this Hamid because I didn't listen to you and I listened to someone whose name I don't even know. And one of the reviewers said, well, this is a beautiful manuscript. Why, what are all these footnotes? I, I cannot read the narrative. I, I don't want to look and go and look at the footnotes, get rid of all the footnotes. And then I felt liberated <laughs> and actually changed the entire um, entire manuscript. I'm saying all of this to say that writing this book was a, um, uh, particularly in terms of writing, a challenge for me. Although I had the the privilege of of uh, others. Um, um, uh, uh, my editor, who Vita uh, Musavi, who helped me a great deal, or who worked with me and spent hours and hours, in some respect, I thought I sometimes feel that this is a effective work. But it was also emotionally a very painful experience for me. This is partly in response to you, Kiana John, that. Um, um, you read all my thoughts. This was my challenge as well. Um, I uh, I wrote this book, or I begin writing this book, actually not thinking that I am resentful to any of the people who did what they did to me. Um, if we had time, I could give you example, but since we don't have time, let me give you a very a, a perhaps a minor examples of somebody whose name we don't know because I don't want to get into larger political issues. One of the most difficult time of my life that I briefly <laughs> discuss in the book but I really try to hide the whole issue was when I was in seventh grade or in, in Iran we say seventh grade, say first year of high school, and a group of bullies made my life so difficult. I was beaten up on a <laughs> daily basis. And um, I failed that class because just trying to deal as a, a, a really lonely person. I was new to the town, new to high school, and there were a group of uh, bullies who um, did not want me in, in the high school. I still don't know why they never wanted me in, in that high school, and and they um, they abused, they they beat me up on really on a, on a daily basis, and I just decided to fight them, and I lost the battle every single time and bruised. Um, um, I left that town, the Havant, and um, when I was. Um, uh, I was at Tehran University, second year. Um, and, and I was reading either a Tela'at or Keihan, and I, I saw a picture of somebody I knew. And I read the story. This was the, the gang leader who uh, did all horrible things to me. But this person 
joined a group of uh, of um, a, a radical Muslim radical group called Abu Zar, sort of um, known in in Iranian political circles, um, and, and then joined Mujahideen. And so this person who was a bully becomes political later and joined Mujahideen Khalq. And the, the news I was reading was when Sawak um, attacked their house and this person was killed. And um, I felt very sad and I felt as really a friend has been killed. Um, 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 and I was surprised that I was not resentful against this person because I felt that that was part of my life and I probably fighting these people, it helped me. Um, but at the same time, I had to say something. This is what makes it difficult. What I said about Obanatek, what I said about Dr. Shafi Katkani, what I said even about my mentor and somebody who I admired so much, Hamid Enayat, who was, you know, I, at Tehran University, I was at um, um, Danish Kadehu Ulum Siyasi. My major was political science, and Dr. Enayat was head of that program. And um, and he was someone who was a role model for me. Um, uh, and all of this, I uh, I just felt this was part of my life, or at really to put it more, in a way I feel is that I felt that, you know, the, all of these experiences were our lives. Um, um, as I have shortcomings and I have made mistakes, and you can see this in the book, you know, we often make these mistakes or uh, have these experiences to, 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 together. To go, to go back to one of the points that uh, Hamid made, um, it is true that I, you know, we moved from one city to another city, and I was always um, treated or imagined as an outsider. But the way I see this story is that I went to these new places. I was always very excited, and one made those places home. I never, this Karibe and Gurbat, as hard, hard as it is. Um, I never define myself as Karibe or beyond in Gorbat. First of all, there was no home. So I couldn't say like Hamid does. Hamid, Hamid has been helping me or maybe <laughs> challenging me as we have talked about this manuscript in on two issues, which uh, this morning, actually, I was thinking, okay, um, um, Hamid's contribution to this book is tremendous, but there are two areas that I didn't think of until uh, this morning. And that's, these these were two, two of my thoughts that Hamid may, in other words, hidden uh, in my, um, my world that Hamid made both very, uh, um, uh, very, um, very visible to me. Um, one is that um, uh, Hamid wrote an earlier version and told me, or actually in in the in the comments, uh, well, you don't say anything about how you how you survive in Tehran. Did you work? Who supported you? Now that I think of it, I don't think I even responded. I did respond to Hamid, but not on this question. And then one in person has said this. And I think in a group discussion at Columbia, he also generally mentioned this. And um, I may 
got a little annoyed, but but I didn't get the point because I sort of felt that why why does Hamid think that oh well Hamid did explain that his main issue was that he uh, surviving from uh, somebody who is from Ahwaz in Tehran it was a big issue. Talk about those things. I just focused on the fact that that was not an issue for me and there is nothing or there isn't much to, to write. But this morning, I thought this is my unthought. I don't realize that for many people, I can remember many of my friends, this was a big issue. And it's not that this was not an issue for me. It's not that it was not part of my story. It was part of my story, but in a different way. And it should have been in the manuscript. I realized this a little late, um, you know, um, but um, 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 I actually thought more because I realized that the first time I heard this, well, before I heard this, because I knew Hamid went to Danish Guy Meli, I always thought that rich kids go to Danish Guy Meli. <laughs> right? Um, by the way, th what this is both ironic and very interesting that, so in Tehran, you were at the sort of uptown university and I was in downtown. And here in New York is the same. And in both cases, you were part of the rich university. But of course, there are people who are poor and were in uh, Danish Guy Berdi. But uh, this was, of course, very careless um, of me. So um, I really, really, and I have to say, even painfully struggle on how do, you, do I want to write and present my memo, right? Because the question was, is that both Keanu and um, and Hamid uh, talked about this. That I'm not, it, this is not confessional. I'm not writing a history to say, oh, I was stupid and it's only because everybody else who should know were more stupid than I was. It's, in other words, I am not the uh, Montesquieu Persian letters character, which I am amazed that still I see very smart people identify or they name their blogs Persian letters. So, of course, I didn't want to write confessional memoirs, Kiana John, and you refer to some of those. But I also didn't want to write something as if I'm writing history. Right? I guess what I said about um, about Hamid's comment should make it clear that um, that there is a lot that I am not covering here, and certainly this point is true. But I also, well, in fact, what somebody asked me, is it a fiction or non-fiction? Do you consider what you're doing fiction or non-fiction? My immediate response is not fiction. But when I thought about this, and I realized, well, what is the implication of saying that? That I am writing about facts, <laughs> right? How, you know, how, I'm being clever. I'm saying it's not history, but it's facts. But right. So I wanted, I wanted to make a couple of comments about this. In other words, ethically, I just felt that. Um, Whatever I write, to the best of my uh, my ability, should represent what I not what I wish, or not, um, um, or if possible, should just call people, do research, and make sure that I'm not um, misremembering things as much as possible. Um, without calling this whether fiction or non-fiction or, or claiming that uh, it's, it's history. 
I have to say that two texts or two writers helped me in the process. This was really early in the process. One was someone who I used to admire quite a lot. I'm very critical of, but still I find him to be very helpful. And that's, that is Michel Foucault's notion of care of the self. So I inspired in the history of sexuality, I inspired by this in a really broad way. So I, I'm not gonna discuss Foucault, but I'm, I'm using this to, um, to really explain how I, as I was writing this book, what was my thinking. And here I wanna read this so that I don't go forever. So this is what I wrote. I, I think of my memory, I think of my memory of the past, not as a private or personal part of my life I should keep to myself and, and outside of the public attention but stories of shared moments and experiences with friends and many others. And by this, I really mean that these are stories of my friends, teachers, those who we participated in demonstrations, political activities, my high school teachers, people at the universities, uh, in other words, I feel that this is something that certainly bigger me, uh, bigger than me. I'm telling stories that is, is, to, is not a story of an individual or a, a private person as um, already um, Hamid mentioned this. And for this reason, this is really what my thinking is that and what Foucault um, influenced me. And, and therefore, I felt that I need to share my thoughts with others as a part of the processing of the care for memory. Care of the memory in the same way that Michel Foucault speaks of care of the self, and, and this is what uh, this is uh, this is what Foucault, Foucault says about care of the self as an ethical or he actually uses a spiritual practice. Uh, that's why it's always emotional because it's always about connections among uh, people. Um, I, I, I come back to this, um, but but let me uh, read another passage and then. Uh, than a than a part of an email from a friend. I therefore believe that our memories always involves relationship with others. In my case, people of all humble towns I knew, my friends and teachers in high schools at the university, and so many others who uh, who were at the demonstrations, participated in the revolution, and even those who experienced similar situation in many other places outside of the Iran. I genuinely felt that because I felt that, and this is particularly what I write in the chapter on Gulpai Gan, that part of my own consciousness my own knowing of myself, Iran, uh, all came from listening to radios that were based outside of Iran. Or reading sometimes in Arabic, sometimes in English, sometimes translation in Farsi about Vietnam, about Algeria, about Palestine and, and, and many other places. You can not imagine how happy and also emotional I got uh, when last week a friend and colleague 
who is from Syria, emailed me and after saying some nice uh, things, and actually Hamidjan, um, a, a sort of few sentences about the prose uh, that, that you kindly said, this is what he said. This is the exact quote from email of this, this colleague. I also, it also res resonated with me, it is the memoir, on many, uh, on many levels, from personal qurbat to falling out with all sides during the Syrian revolution and feeling a deep loneliness that your tenacity and journey are immensely inspiring. Uh, these are just few words, but this is from another academic person who, who is based in another uh, uh, institution, who is from Syria and was both in, in, uh, inspired and also felt that this, my narrative also both re reaffirm his sense of loneliness, that if there is time, I will explain, but also that he was inspired because he felt that uh, we, we have more or less a same or similar, um, similar stories. My last point, so that, so, uh, so, um, so I'm using care of the memory to say that I really felt an ethical obligation as I, I write this story. And perhaps this also inspired me to write this. But to respond to the other questions that I raised, and I think to some extent both Kiana and Hamid, uh, Hamid um, um, raised. Um, I found, I, I read very early in the process, uh, Henri Kerr's book, um, Memory, History, and Forgetting, which I find um, um, very, very helpful in my thinking as I uh, as I, um, I, 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 I work and, and I wrote this book. Um, and that is the, um, that is the idea of um, faithfulness that Paul Ricoeur uses in the book. And I just explained these two points, Baba John and then I. And I, I, I read this because otherwise I may go for, for a long time. He argues that the idea of faithfulness is at the heart of memory and remembering. That is a faithfulness to the past that is not a given, but a desire for discovery, which is actually true. Some of my events that you see in the book I sort of rediscovered or discovered because I was working on, on the book. My wife complains or my um, brother complained. You never told us this. And it was hard for me explaining that it's not, you know, this, uh, I also uh, discovered this because I was writing this book and I really appreciate and I, that's what I think that there is a memoir in everybody's mind and, and just sit down and write it because you also uh, learn quite a lot about your own past history. Therefore, we imagine memory and history in the light, in the light of hope, even if it's never fully achieved, right? So that's what I mean that I don't have any resentment. I am saddened, sometimes it's painful, uh, and, and, and I feel a sense of loneliness, um, but it's still a precious moment of my life, whether it's the revolution, whether it's um, fighting those bullies, which every logical people would say 
why did you just move on to another high school? The second point on faithfulness. This is a quote from Paul Ricoeur. That faithful, faithfulness to the past is not just a matter of accuracy and factual, factual correctness. This was really what helped me a great deal. It also requires a commitment to ethical and moral values that are grounded in the past, but have relevance to the present and the future. In this sense, faithfulness to the past is not just an intellectual exercise, but a moral and existential matter. This is, of course, these are Paul Ricoeur's words, but this is what motivated me in writing this book. And this was, I, I hope, uh, um, everyone else agrees, but this is my, this is what I heard from a, a friend of my generation, Hamid, saying, but this is what I also heard of uh, Kiana, someone who, of course, did not share my history or our history or history of my generation, but 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 the story or this my the memory of the past um, is really a narrative of present. And I appreciate it so much, Kiana John, that you talk about today, about uh, Zan Zendegi Azadi, because uh, this is exactly what it is. This is, I, my work is not historiography or, um, or um, a narrative against other narratives. That is what it is. And then after, actually in the past few days after I wrote these comments, by accident, I look at the end of the, of the, of the book. Last page of the, the Loneliest Revolution. Um, and I realized that I wrote something similar. These are two sentences I read and then I stop. I'm trying to explain what is the why somebody would write a memoir, or at least why I did this. And after writing a couple of paragraphs, I say, for what, <clears throat> sorry, for, for what is the purpose of one person telling their story, except to help confirm that we are not alone, that we leave, and dream together, and that we ultimately build a new world of mutual respect. And that is really what I believe. That's when I said I don't have any resentment toward anyone. That was not my motivation. That is what I mean. And um, and both Hamijan and Kian, Kian Arjan, um, when I saw you and I heard you making those comments, I felt at least in this context, um, uh, I was right. This is why we we keep these memories, we take care of them, and we share them with friends and with anybody who is interested in uh, listening. Thank you so much. And I apologize if I went further than my time. Thank you so much, Ali John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Hamid Kiana. I, I cannot tell you how super happy I am to hear this conversation. It's a conversation that will continue for another uh, 40 minutes. If you could stay, that would be great. Uh, I'd like to uh, start with uh, my comments and questions and then I'll open up to, to Q&A. Um, um, Ali kindly mentioned... Uh, uh, my idea of of having this event, and I'm most grateful for him to acknowledging that, um, Adijan, this is really a, a labor of love. And I tell you this because um, I love, first and foremost, having these events, which we have conversations, but also I very much like 
to invite um, scholars who might not actually agree with. Um, you kindly made reference to a review I made of your book years ago, which was critical. And um, I also remember you invited me and we had an interesting discussion about that review while yes. having dinner. And in fact, what I remember most importantly about that conversation was the dinner itself with the food, the taste, the sensuality of the food as we explored these various ideas. In fact, I would suggest, and this is something, Ali John, I, I com commenting on your last point, that ultimately is my ideal of Iran and beyond Iran, Iran beyond borders, as Hamid talks about. Huh. It's the it's the idea of Iran of critical thinking, critical discourse, but most importantly, a, a, a kind of a discourse that keeps the friendship aspect in the middle of it. A kind of a friendship that does not need to be all about tarof, and but it's a really a friendship of hey, you know, I disagree with you, but. You are fragments of Iran in which I see myself through you. You have a wonderful passage in page 249, actually very much resembles Hamid's uh, idea of Iran too. The Iran I see fragmenting is not the country in its territorial sense, but an idea remembered and reconstituted by Iranians across generational, political, and geographical fault lines. These imaginative nationalisms Imaginative nationalisms are untethered to land borders and ideologies that cohere them. Iran is encountered as fragments, but, e but each of its parts is imagined as a totality to celebrate it. It's like a video collage. It's like a, <laughs> it's like a video installation you see in an in a art performance piece, which while you're encountering all these different episodes and fragments, you're actually finding yourself in these multiple mirrors and ultimately, this this is something I I like to underline with what you're proposing about Iran. It's certainly not the Iran of what you see, California University of California Irvine Iranian Center Persian Center is advocating, the Iran of um, Iran Shah, this new Sasanid imperial language, which is, you know, you know very clearly where it's coming from. But I very much think that this is a completely opposite idea of Iran. I very much want to celebrate this. So I, I, I wanted to let you know, this is why I wanted to have this so for us to have a conversation, critical one, but out of deep friendship and respect. So that's one thing I wanted to clear. Now, having said that, of course, um, I, I do want to have a critical discussion. Um, I have uh, one historical question. Yeah. On page 20, uh, uh, 226, you talk about Kazem, I think, he, the guy that got released from prison. Mm -hmm. And you ask a question about the possibility of counter-revolution. So um, my first question is whether the idea of a counter-revolution was pervasively in the minds of the revolutionaries during that time. So it's kind of a historical question I have. is actually a research question for myself. I just wanted to know if that was very much of the mood at that time. Of course, I remember Kazem didn't answer your question, which is very interesting, if I remember correctly. Um, my second point is really a more theoretical one. It has a lot to do with what we were just talking about, memory, on thought. Kiana talked about memoir um, and, of course, how this book very much differs from the traditional memoir culture. Of course, a memoir should be distinguished from autobiography. Of course, the most famous autobiography is by the Rousseauian tradition of talking, celebrating the self. Memoir is mostly about memorialization of the self. It's, it's a kind of a very distinct kind of a genre. And for the last 20 years, there's an industry behind it with regards to Iranian writers, especially Iranian women diasporic subjects who want to celebrate the ideal womanhood, which is very much of what Azar Nafisi had in mind, the idea of a, a liberated woman who becomes liberated because of some kind of in, in, encounter with the West. Uh, just to let everyone know, there is a film, film version of, of Azar Nafisi's book that is coming out. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to watch that, but probably um, I'll, I'll uh, we'll figure that part out. But anyway, um, but in my opinion, I don't think this is a memoir. I think Hamid talked about this very interestingly too. This is I, I argue that this is actually a counter memoir, and it's a counter memoir because it's talking about the elements of the unthought, the unthought, mm -hmm. the things that we do not know, the things that we can, the opaque memories that are somewhere lingering but we can't touch them and and this is why when i left after finish finishing your book which actually happened to me I always write the the day when, when i read a book finish a book it was may 3rd 2023 
I I kept saying, oh my God, there's so much questions. There's so many things I want to know about Ali, about revolution. But that's precisely what the book wanted to do, not to memorialize, but to open up this horizon of questions that Ali would be transformed into a big question mark. Uh, Ali, I want to learn more, Ali, of the Iranian revolution. This very much reminded me of Kant's um, notion of rhapsody of perception, experiences that resists synthesis to conscious thought or conscious entities. And it's such a counter idea of a revolution the way we have traditionally understand it. it. Revolutions are about memory, consciousness. I mean, Lenin is famous for talking about dreams. You need to have conscious dreams of making the party go forward for making a revolution. This is the opposite. This is a revolution. It's lonely because he doesn't know what the hell happened. And he still doesn't know how it's unfolding in temporality, um, given the fact we haven't seen the effects of it. And this is the final point I want to make, Ali. It's interesting that unconsciously, <laughs> on, on thought-wise, whatever you want to call it, um, originally when I was distributing your book across campus, I had as the title, not the loneliest revolution, I put it as longest revolution. It only took me a week later to figure out, oh my God, I'm making a mistake. So I had to, of course, correct it. And right there, there was this moment of, uh, Umberto Eco, Eco calls the serendipities of history, where that moment of error actually gave me this awareness of how there's a double-edged sword in your memoir, that there is this longness, there is this longness of forgetting in your book, which seems and feels so lonely, like unconsciously, actually brought it into, of course, I corrected it, not to worry, but nevertheless, the point I'm trying to make here is that, and this is my question, whether whether the revolution of Ali Mir Sapasi, the revolution that he encountered and experienced, and to this day he's writing a counter memory of it, is actually still in existence, unfolding. Kiana talked about the, the, the unfolding unrest in Iran for last half, you know, half a year or so more. Are we really seeing, did we really ever see the end of the revolution or we're we still experiencing the revolution? As famously, uh, Zhu Enlai, the famous um, Chinese premier said, you know, someone asked him if the French revolution, what do you think the effects of the French revolution is like, well, you know, uh, was, it's too early to say, you know? So um, I'm wondering about this, this, the loneliest and the longest in terms of memory and forgetting. That was a lot that I had to say um, and I'm going to stop and I'm going to open up and have you respond. Thank you so much, Adi-chan. Uh, many, many thanks, Babak John. Uh, the first question, I respond briefly, but since you said this may be something that relevant to research, I would be happy to talk to you and give you a fuller story on this, uh, if you like. Um, sure, sure. Um, so as I describe in the book, I was a, at the Tehran University, I was a supporter of Fadayan. And um, now that it's a revolutionary situation, we were looking for them. <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting. I, I actually don't talk about these in the book, but um, you know, we have a pretty good infrastructure. We had our friends who work in foreign ministry. They had um, um, several copy, copy machines of that generation uh, available. We had a network of people who would distribute leaflets and political um, um, statements, but we could not find a, a sort of direct way to Fadayan to see what they are doing, how we can help. And this meeting, um, the purpose of this meeting was to just find out about this person who just was released. Um, 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 and soon we learned that there are no Fadayans really outside of prison or people who were just uh, just uh, out or people like us. The issue of counter-revolution was more of a personal issue for me because 
whenever I raised a critical question, and that was mainly that my view was that the left need to um, keep certain boundaries, certain independence of itself. We should not be just join, uh, of course, sea of people, and this was very inspiring too. I, I'm not um, denying that, and just, um, um, uh, but we should organize ourselves better. We should keep some independence. And I was critical of particularly attacks by Hezbollahis. This is before revolution, of our female comrades. And the sort of the stereotypical response I would get from my, my friends or other activists who seem to have more experience is that this can lead, this can help the counter revolution. We were all concerned about this issue, but when I reflect on this now, this was really used to silence someone like me too. So it, it, it had both of those functions, but I would be more than happy to talk to you later about this. Uh, and I have to also say that it's very easy to say that Shah's regime um, fall was quick or easy, or um, even in the summer, none of us thought that there will be a revolution. Um, uh, we all thought that the regime is very strong. It has all these security forces, has support mm. of every foreign country, army, whatever. Um, um, everything became easy after it, it happened. Um, your second issue is, um, of course, I struggle with that too. Mm. But... Um, 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 I did not necessarily define this book as either a memoir. I knew that this is not an autobiography uh, and I did not want to um, use any kind of ideas that give the, um, gives the impression that this is history. Um, um, it became a memoir, mainly because the publisher, although this really went to several publishers, um, various conversations I had with book agents and publishers, and uh, I did not have the um, the um, privilege of coming up with a <laughs> counter me memoir um, option. I thought what I did, both with the title, which is also part of your question, the, the loneliest, and the, the memoir issue was, I did not want to have memoir as the, the title. I agreed to have it as the, a subtitle. Um, and with the title, um, I did not necessarily want to have something negative, like lost, <laughs> whatever. Um, but I did not want to have this. I did want to, did not want to misrepresent the story, the overall story, as a story of, um, of as as positive. So what? It may be that it is, it is not working. So there is both the loneliest and solidarity. And in my thinking, I feel that I am most of the book is a stories of solidarity, collective um, experiences, just inspiring by events not only in Iran, but in the world, and all are collective. In fact, I do talk about the spirit or spirituality of revolution, and I describe it as 
just being with hundreds and thousands of people you don't know, but you trust everybody. That's solidarity, that is spirit. And what I am trying to say is that my life that started that way, the revolution that was revolution of trust and solidarity have torn us apart. I actually discussed that in the book. Uh, let me very briefly tell this story that is in the book. I think that would tell what I really mean with both uh, solidarity and loneliness. A very young professor at Tehran University who really inspired me and I developed a friendship, at least from my perspective. I'm sure that he doesn't remember me, but I very much always thought of him as one of the precious people I have met, but Dr. Shafi Katkarim, that I think the first year or the first semester I had a class with. So this is in the 70s in Tehran. I never ever saw him until recently when if I live in Princeton, New Jersey, and a friend told me Dr. Shafi'i is here at Princeton, mm -hmm. and he will be here for a year. <laughs> you don't know, although I'm not young, but how happy and how elated I just felt that my, um, uh, my inspiring teacher is here. And, you know, Princeton is a little village here, and I live here, you know. I just was thinking of spending so much time with him, but of course, at least meeting him. And so I, to this friend, I sent a message that I was his, um, his student at Tehran University. I live, I live here and I love to see him. And in a day or two, the response was that he does not want to see you or anyone. And the interpretation by this, the person who took my message was, well, he's probably concerned about meeting others and what happens when he, he goes back. I, I cried quite a lot for a couple of, at least a couple of times, not, not even no more than to see that Dr. Shafi Katkani was, was actually a political person when he was our teacher. He was very courageous. He wrote Kuchiba Khoye Neishabur, praising Mujahideen and Fadayan. These were very difficult things to do during the Shah. And I was his student. He, he, he partly inspired you know, people like me to joining the revolution. And now he's in, he's 10 minutes from me and does not want to even see me. It, and it's not that, in the meanwhile, some tension created or not. Mm. This is this is how our life has been torn apart. Mm. Right? In other words, both are part of our, 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 our world. Mm. Uh, or to respond, the revolution has ended in some respect. If you describe it, if if you see revolution in terms of the Islamic Republic, the first time that I got into trouble with the government and I was in a telephone call. Uh, it was shocking when they called me counter-revolutionary because I always thought of myself as revolutionary. <laughs> but it took time, and, uh, uh, right? So in, in other words, it's both. It, it had, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I agree with, with, with what you said. Right. Sorry, Ivan. No, that's much. fantastic. Thank you so much. So now we are, Thank you so much, Ajahn. We, now we are open to questions. Uh, we have uh, students, faculty. We have, you know, um, uh, Professor Raz Razavi, um, Professor Kazemi, <laughs> uh, Professor Kamali. There are so many people. There are so many cool, exciting people here. Of course, we have students. So we are we are open to questions. Anyone uh, would like to um, oh. go first? 
There are lots of also questions on the chat. Yes, yes, that's a good point. The Maybe comments are very small. I cannot read them. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Let me see which one I could ask first while you are, while others are thinking about their question. Um, I'm curious to know what academics and scholars uh, you most enjoyed early or during your time at Tehran University, and if how the influence has reappeared in this recent publication. This is from Brittany. So if I understand it correctly, um, is this question about what intellectuals and professors... Yes. What academics and scholars you most enjoyed early on during your time at Tehran University? Yeah. And how okay. did they influence you in this? Well, okay. First of all, um, um, it was a very, very, very busy time. I have to tell you that... Um, and again, I was a young Shahristani student in Tehran, so I, I don't want to misrepresent. I was part of lots of interesting um, events and things going on, but as a sort of outsider. Um, there wasn't a week that I did not go to a theater or a um, some kind of exhibitions or talks um, um, or other kind of intellectual or artistic events. Um, this was part of everybody's life, but then there were Hatok. Um, this, as far as I know, is still um, exist. And in, in fact, very important part of everybody's life was these potholes. Uh, unfortunately for me, there were some important potholes that I never accessed. I knew that on Wednesdays, these group of <coughs> scholars and artists and others get together. But, you know, I had uh, these three or four mentors and for instance, this older student who later became a publisher and a, a, a scholar and published many books and joined Mujahideen and, and unfortunately was killed during the, the when Mujahideen entered Iran to take Tehran, had lots of connection with Mashhadis, mm. uh, including Akhavan Salas, and their part was in a a a um, a bookstore or a really a a publisher, tools in Tasharat tools. Mm, mm, there mm. was one um, evening that everybody would gather there. I would go. I just enjoyed these very important people talking or sometimes presenting their work or discussing things. Um, but there were several of them. Uh, that I uh, I personally uh, participated. Patoks were extremely, extremely important. And then part of it was, of course, um, uh, that just depended on, on, on individuals, uh, including, um, including the you know, studies groups and other things we had. But um, 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 I was not able, after the revolution, I could not go to Iran for about 15 years. So the first time I returned was um, after 15 years. And in fact, those were difficult times, but um, basically every, everybody I met or all the wonderful experience of my first meeting was these part talks. And I have to say that I was invited to so many of them, I couldn't go to all, uh, but there were about four or five, and, and these are weekly usually. And in fact, uh, since uh, uh, Kamari is here, I met him on those Wednesday potholes that were mainly with um, what we call religious intellectuals. Although Ari Kamali and I, we both live in <laughs> and work in, in New York, I first met him there. Every time I went there, I attended, I would not miss those Wednesdays, but then there were 
three or four others that I would go on a weekly basis. But what was missing or the difference between though that time um, in Tehran after revolution or pre-revolutionary was that, um, that more public intellectual or artistic events that we would go to. We would not, as a young university student, I would not miss a single talk that anybody would give. And of course, we always go for food, Babak John, and talk. <laughs> that was always part of it. And, Politics of food. <laughs> and also social, yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> I hope I, I... No, great, thank you so much. Um, this is, um, we have 10 minutes left, so please, anyone else, um, if you have questions, you could write there. Oh, well, it would be great okay. if you just pose Ooh, the yeah. question. I'm, I'm sorry? If they just pose the question. That's since... true, too. yeah. You could also, uh, well, maybe we could take Puria. I think Puria has a question. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, yeah, Professor. So my question is that, as you mentioned, um, you thought of yourself as a revolutionary as well. So what do you think differentiated you with the Islamic revolutionaries? This is actually a great, great, yeah, great, question. great question. And um, um, my assumption is that you have not read the book because I, 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 I think in really details, I, I, um, I try to explain this. Uh, first of all, it was almost impossible to do so, right? Um, um, to really understand what I'm trying to say, you have to sort of um, forget what happened after the revolution, right? Um, so I mentioned Dr. Shafi Katkani. Oh, and my personal mentor, Hamid Enayat, right? Uh, and I tell their story in the book. Both of these were influenced by Marxism. Hamid Enayat actually was one of the early founder of Confederation member of the two the party when he was high school, right? Who in the 60s and really 70s um, affiliated what with people like Fardid and Ayatollah Mutahari and became religious. Shafi Katkani was went to Jose El Mie, was a, um, a mullah uh, who, when I had him, he was probably in his late 20s or early 30s. And I learned that a year or two years before, he decided not to wear the, what do you call, clearly called um, a uniform that was also very much uh, influenced by Marxism. He basically used Marxist analysis in his um, in the class, and he was sympathetic both to Fadayan and Mujahideen. Um, and the person who really uh, both gave me books that were not available, which were Marxist books, was Abu Zair Vardasvi, who was a very religious, radical person. And he connected me with other Marxists. Um, but I, I, I want to tell you something that would, that you may conclude how shallow I was at the time, maybe even now, is that um, this became a very complicated issue with me. And I felt that not really knowing or understanding what was happening in Iran. Um, early on at the university, I said, I have to decide, uh, am I a Muslim activist or a Marxist activist? And I tried hard 
I couldn't come up, I couldn't really make up our, my mind. And then there was a protest at Tehran University for a big occasion. And, um, and usually what happened in these occasions, these are public, very, very, um, 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 risky things that people would do. But usually what happened is that at the end of the uh, demonstration, one person would, would speak briefly and then people disappear before the police would come after us or, or arrest us. And actually many times uh, some of us would be arrested. And I loved what this person said. And I told myself, I am going to find out if this person is a Marxist or a or a religious um, person, and I'm going to just follow that. And I find out that he was a member of the Palestine group, mm. the Marxist group, although Palestine, right? And from day on, I decided that I am a Marxist, but I have to tell you that I would go to Marxist meetings and I would see laws of radical Mujahideen types there too. Um, and then when revolution happened, it become, became even worse. So my encounter with Human Ateh represents this too, that, that Human Ateh, who I knew when I was early in the university, everybody knew that she was a of course, a great scholar and activist and everything, but was a Marxist um, and, of course, a historian. And and she worked with Fadayins. These were all public knowledge. And um, but he was, she was the one who defended Etola uh, Khomeini. It was extremely hard, very very hard. And um, and that was true with families and social gatherings in the arts, and everything. The only thing that I was able to avoid, I hope nobody minds this, this is just telling what I did. I avoided going to Shariati's uh, lecture, <laughs> although uh, it was extremely hard. Um, all sorts of people would go. Thank you for the question. Okay, thank you. So we only have a few minutes left, but I, I thought maybe I could get two questions from uh, the chat, unless someone else has a question um, that you know is, wants to be expressed through just Zoom instead of chat. Um, anyone? Uh, okay. So let me read the chat questions. Um, uh, one is, um, thank you for a great conversation. In the 13, 1380s, so this would be, uh, you know, 2000s, um, these patoks were once again reproduced at uh, Tehran University. However, during that time, we did not receive support from the faculty and were also concerned about attracting negative attention from some senior faculty members. Sophia uh, Katkani, in particular, frequently criticized modern students and writers. So the question is about you know how things changed in two thousands in the post revolution, which the, the faculty weren't really that supportive. Uh, so, Bobby you know, Chan, excuse yeah. me, if I can. Oh, sorry, did you want to ask your question? To oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Farshad. Go if ahead. If I can, sorry. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the great conversation, Professor Mr. Um I just wanted to clarify what I wrote there. Um, um, I recently wrote actually a chapter about how. Um, um, the, the, the literary scholarship in Iran, the University of Tehran in particular, depoliticized uh, literary criticism through the process of canonization. And Shafiq Katkani had the great role to depoliticize literature, especially after the revolution. That was very interesting. Uh, well, I know the background of Shafiq Katkani, uh, but, uh, but he has been advocating leftist uh, activists before the revolution, at least. But it was very, very interesting for me. Uh, I just wanted to um uh, hear more about um your experience with um them and um uh, probably uh, ask why do you think they have changed that much like i was not able to um like, as you know there is uh, like it, this is coming to uh, put on flyers on the wall to for for your defense session for my master's degree i wasn't able to do that because um uh, the um, chair of the faculty head of faculty was afraid that Shafiq Katkani would come to the session and ruin everything because I was too 
political slash modernist. So why do you think this change has happened? Like that 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 would be a radical change, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a great question. I try, although not in great details, to explain this, particular and and, and actually through life of, or at least my understanding of uh, what Dr. Shafiq Kakani decided to do after the revolution. Um, it's very interesting. I. Uh, it's not that he was, which he was my my professor, but um, for the four years that I was at Tehran University, um, there wasn't a month that I somehow would not see him and follow him, and very much so. In fact, um, a group of us at Tehran University we published a journal. Um, uh, Fakhreddin Azimi, um, it was myself and, and several other students. And uh, we were so close with Shafiq Katkani that he wrote for our journals and gave his poetry. We were very close, or, well, very close may not be the right. We were, he was our mentor, let's say this. Um, he was very, uh, he was a radical. He was in class. I, I think I talk about this in the book. He was very scholarly. He always told us that be careful, not politicize every analysis of literature that we have, but he would always put aside some time to talk about politics. Right, and certainly outside of the class, he was a big supporter of us, right? And he was a modernist and he was in a rather substantial way uh, responsible for uh, all of us being critical of what at the time we call classic literature. Uh, he just changed after the revolution because he wanted to survive. And I think over time, um, he became a, a he 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 had this maybe for sometimes in the first decade of revolution he was the only name that everybody knew and both the um, the sort of government institutions and individuals and others praised and he published, he did lots of work, but he did all of this by uh, distancing from new uh, um, literary world and um, by publishing on classic uh, texts, which I, I am not trying to say he hated those early on, but he had a mission of, um, of advocating for new literature. Um, and he became a conservative, and he also became a more of a nationalist. Some of his uh, really dismissive comments about other kind of literature, uh, I am amazed in hearing this because one thing that I really lear learned from Shafiq Katkani, and it was an eye opening for me, was was his um, his argument that that we cannot just say Persian literature, uh, and he said literature of Khorasan is um, is very important. It has its own. It's a uh, world. It's a very school literary school that you have to learn it on its own. Um, and different parts of Iran represent different uh, cultural literary um, uh, traditions that we have to appreciate. But now he is he has become one of those Iran Shahri kind of mm. uh, folks. Um, um, my second point is that um, the universities there is no comparison between pre and post revolutionary universities. Mm. 
students have by far more power now, right? You may be surprised to hear this, but they do. But, um, but the government has the influence at the grassroots mm. that the Pahlavi government never had. I was at Tehran University School of Law and Political Science. Most of our professors were, um, we would call them maqamat, were ministers or head of these or other government institutions. They would just come and teach and leave and we never had any interactions with them. Other professors were all um, um, critical or part of the opposition. And we all felt very secure and safe with them. And they were very supportive. Um, there was no confusion on who is with whom. And, um, and also outside of the university, in the arts and culture, um, uh, in these meetings or portals and all of these that we went, uh, it was a little like now that um, there wasn't a single person who would be, would even make comments supportive of the government, including many people who work for the government. Um, uh, the problem, however, was that in the larger society, it was very hard to publicly discuss anything. My family did not know that I was a political activist until the revolution. Whereas now you more or less know <laughs> what people think. They, they Thank you. Certainly know. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, we are um, over our time and yet we could still go on. Um, uh, however, we do have to end. Um, I cannot thank you enough, Professor Mr. Pasi, for this wonderful, wonderful talk, for this um, generous discussion about your your past self, your present self, your future self, however you want to describe it. I'm also grateful for everyone for staying uh, for this long, and this means that everyone enjoyed it. Uh, there was a good discussion. I do want to invite everyone to next Thursday's talk, Light of the Aryans, Racial Identity Among Iranian Americans, a talk by Professor Sahar Razavi. Uh, and you could get the info uh, about that event on campus that will take place on campus from me. Um, but otherwise, I just want to, again, um, thank you, Professor Mr. Fassi, for this wonderful talk. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Babak John. I know that Hamid had to leave a little early. Thank you, Kiana John, and all friends and everyone who is here. I really enjoyed this and hope to see you soon. Great. Um, thank you. And thank you, Kiana John, too. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.